Hi, everyone. I'm James Garbutt. And I'm Denny Dumas. And this is the Garbutt Dumas Real Estate Podcast. I'm excited here, Carl. We have a guest today. His name is Raj Gill, and, and uh, he builds custom homes for a living. We both uh, live and work in New Westminster. We're neighbors-ish in the same neighborhood. And uh, I'm excited to have him on because I think in, in today's market, a lot of people are curious about how much it costs to build a home, what the building process is like, what it's like to just, uh, whether it's a significant renovation or a new build, just understand that process. So Raj, thank you for coming on here. No, thank you thank for you having for, me. And, and Raj's company is called Versa Developments. Uh, I took this from your social handle and website. You build custom homes, you do heritage revitalizations, uh, like significant renovations, is that, that correct? That is correct, yep. yeah. Uh, and subdivisions rezoning. Yes. And, and the focus of, I guess, a simple metric that you hear often today, it says step code three to five. Correct. So that's, that's a measurement of efficiency. And Yeah, we try to take our homes now just to a little higher level. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the focus on these days are energy efficiency, so we try to take it a little one step higher and kind of gear our clients, uh, customers want to build their home, push them that way because I see a lot of added value there. Yeah, you know, I I want to get into that, so I don't want to cover too much <laughs> of the step code three to four yet. And I have nerded out on step code before, and I don't want to lose all of our listeners this early in the episode. <laughs> so, it's exciting. So, <laughs> it is. It is. Um, let's just start by giving people a good idea who you are. So, how how long have you been building for? Um, so. Like you said, my name is Raj Gill. I'm, uh, I run a company named Versa Developments. Uh, we've been building since 2008. Uh, probably built 40 plus houses in U.S. Minster. Um, <clears throat> and like you said, we've built uh, single families. Uh, do uh, We've done a few heritage revitalizations, uh, you know, lift and move, uh, bring houses in from other cities to land in here and uh, do a full restoration. Um, but our primary gig is on the new homes. Um, on the renovation side, we team up with another company, local company here, who does renovation work, and uh, and it's been successful. I think we can probably. I think they would appreciate plugging Hyatt Construction. Is that the uh, company that you work That's with right. often? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're, uh, so so we'll uh, partner up on major renovations. Yeah. Um, I think they enjoy my talent there, and yeah. and I enjoy their talent. Um, and you know, they got a little bit more manpower than I do. So it works well hand in hand. Yeah, I, I guess just to be clear, I know Raj fairly well, and I know his business fairly well. So to help paint the picture, it is New Westminster focused. Correct. Is, and do you dabble in Burnaby or? Uh, we I've done one or two in Burnaby. Um, you know, I've done some my own projects in Vancouver, uh, but our primary uh, custom home work is. In and I've asked, hey, Raj, will you go to North Van? Will you go to, <laughs> and the answer is no. So yeah. it's pretty focused. I mean, yeah. I mean, you may have contacts or, you yeah. know, people in different markets, but it is a New West Mr. Yeah. Focus business. That being said, building a house in New West, the principles really apply the same in Burnaby or Coquitlam and neighboring markets. Might pretty. be a little bit different on the west side of Vancouver. But, yeah. yeah, and not to get too much into it. There's different step codes in every city now. Yeah. Uh, some are more advanced we'll than we are, but we can get into that a little bit later. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely will. <laughs> so, um, I, I mean, by the numbers, I see mostly new, newer homes, custom built homes. And, uh, I mean, there aren't many heritage revitalizations agreements going on, but I know that you did, uh, you were involved in one in Queens park that involved lifting and putting two hundred year old homes on the back of a lot. I think it was on Manitoba street. That's right. Yeah. 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 So I, I want to get into that a bit because there are, you know, uh, you know, New West Queens Park is is unique for heritage revitalizations, but it also applies to a lot of markets in Vancouver, and I'm seeing in Port Moody too. So, um, but we'll dig into that. So, just to, yeah. be, to be clear, New West Minister Home Builder, bulk of the business is custom homes. Um, I've seen a range of styles from you. I've seen modern. I've seen craftsman, uh -huh. uh, and and the partnership with Hyatt Construction, which is a local building company. Often, those are like Raj. Correct me if I'm wrong. Your specialty in the bulk of your trades are, are accustomed to new construction. When you get into a heritage revitalization, it's a really complicated project that involves a lot more finicking around. And that's where your partnership with Hyatt comes into. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I mainly deal with new construction. It's usually A to Z is yeah. pretty smooth, but you get into the major renovation. You just don't know what you're going to get into until you start opening up walls and lifting up houses and, uh, you know, 
you have structural issues. There's a lot more work. And, um, and then you obviously want to reach out to someone who's that's their bread and butter and team up with them. Uh, sometimes, you know, I'll get the client calling me or they'll call them. And then, you know, if it's too big for them, we kind of balance off each mm-hmm. other, bounce off each other and kind of work together. Uh, yeah, you just don't know what you're getting into in a rental, right? You hear, you hear it all the time. Well, Someone's doing a rental and they're, you know, 100 grand, 200 grand over the budget because you just don't <laughs> know what you're getting into. I guess to be specific, I, I, I totally, the process is completely different. You don't know until you open up the walls. I mean, on the trade levels, the, the, the trades that you subcontract out to, I imagine a few of the ones that are specific to new construction might be just uh, don't have a clue where to begin in, in significant rentals, like framing maybe? Yeah. Or Th- There's some new construction trade guys that don't want to touch rentals. Yeah. At <laughs> the uh, end of the day, it's just more work. There's more leveling. There's more, you know, framing and, you know, and it's not done properly. Yeah. And so it's a little bit of a gray area. Uh, but I do have new construction trade guys that won't touch rentals. Fair enough. I don't, I don't blame them. I think you stay in your wheelhouse. So let's, let's talk about the process a bit. Like, you know, I know every client that you take on probably has a different timeline, different scenario, but yep. generally speaking, what are, when should someone that wants to build a home, you know, if someone's listening to this in New Westminster and thinks, okay, I want to build a home in New West, uh, when, at what point do they reach out to you? And, and I, I guess there's a scenario where they don't have the land and there's a scenario where they do have the land. Right. But at what point do you suggest that people typically contact you? Um, it's always nice when they purchase the land. Um, you know, we, we do have a tree bylaw, so home buyers don't really know what they're getting into when they buy yeah. land. You know, it's super sloped, um, or there's, you know, investment trees that you can't take down, and which a homeowner might not, not know, or there's a neighbor's tree that's in the, interfering with the roots coming into their yard. Um, so I don't mind getting involved a little early in the stage. I do have potential clients that call me and say, hey, Roger, what do you think of this lot? You know, value-wise yeah. or... What do you think? And I'll quickly Google Earth it, take a look. And, you know, my main concern is trees, right? Um, so, but the better is when they do on the lot and they want to hire a, a designer or an architect, I will kind of guide them or help them out if they don't know any. Because usually people don't have any contacts. Mm. Uh, and also designing the home, I'll, I like to get, I like to be involved in the early stages and point out potential problems, uh, extra costs. You know, just things that I personally see where a designer or architect doesn't see. Uh, so I like to give my input at an early stage. You know, so you get these designers putting in pocket doors and, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, in a few years, you, you, you're going to have issues with this thing, right? Pocket let's, doors. Let's be, yeah. on, let's be honest. But some designers love yeah. them and I, I personally <laughs> dislike them. But that's just a small thing. Yeah. You know, just door configurations and vanity sizes. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little nitpicky on washroom sizes, how long this should be and uh so it's nice to give the owner some feedback because then end of the day when i start building it i give them a better product right there's no try to get much out of the way you know staring out a window looking at a post you know just yeah you know try to work with the architect hey can we extend the deck out move the post over this way and just just cosmetic stuff my guess is if someone has reached out to you later in the process and you they have the land and they have a concept plan and they're interviewing builders you probably can't help yourself, but just dig into those plans and focus in on all the little <laughs> yeah, the, the yeah. nitpicky er- errors. You're mentioning, yeah. you know, some cosmetic items like just uh, spacing and bathrooms, yes. vanities, clo- pocket doors. How about the systems of the home? Like if the archi- like in terms of specking is is mechanical or or if you if you see a, a I don't know a designer spec structural beams that are excessive and spans that are excessive, do you run into that much? Yes, yeah. um, like. When you got when you said the word mechanical, the kind of you know pet peeve of mine. Most architects, designers don't plan to where they put the mechanical systems, yeah. right? Um, so, you know, depending on the type of house you're building, having a closet somewhere on the upper floor or the basement dedicated to your mechanical room uh, is always useful. It's always uh, missed. Um, and just so it's just good planning, right? Just. It's nice to get feedback, say, hey, well, you know, where are you going to put the air handler? Because most people want AC these days, right? So we're going to put the HRV in it. And then they're like, oh, uh, we don't know yet. Mm, <laughs> so, yeah. so then you're sticking it up in this closet. Uh, you know, it's kind of hums and they don't like it there. So depending on the style of the house, uh, you know, we'll get into later. But talking about step code, um, 
you can always hire a mechanical engineer design how you're gonna mechanically heat and cool your home and ventilate um but speaking of that just briefly yeah you can ha- ha- you know hire a mechanical engineer to or someone that comes up with the design yes of the, is that something that i mean in the typical home that you build yes um is that something that you would recommend or would you recommend just having a chat with you first about it then reaching out there because what i'm getting at is it, the list of consultants and professionals can yes. get long if you hire out 100%. lighting plan landscape yeah. plan uh, all these i think it comes down to your your hvac trade contractor yeah yeah okay, okay. so if you have good faith in your hvac contractor and you trust them uh you've used them in the past uh keep flowing well ac's working well room to room uh you'll be okay but there is a lot of trade guys out there who will take a shortcut uh for example run smaller ducting like they'll run four inch pipe everywhere and, you know not insulate it not duct seal it uh too many branches off the main trunk not get enough airflow from room to room you could have mm. issues and uh not be heating or cooling your home the way you <laughs> think it should be no kidding <laughs> so that, that's an example of like something that would be very expensive and challenging to undo if it was done poorly 100%. It's all behind the it's walls. It's all behind the walls. You're ripping out drywall. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of work. And it's not easily you'd be fixed. You'd be adding a space yeah. heater heater to the room and regretting hiring that guy. There, there's a long list of, <laughs> of you know, the cheapest, you know, when you talk yeah. about quality and cost of building a home, there's a long list of stuff that can backfire on you. This is just one of many That's items. That's one of many things <laughs> yeah. that uh, you got to be careful on. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, and again, like hiring a guy who's going to be doing your mechanical engineering work, like your design. He's gonna come and check the quality control. He's gonna make sure, because uh, he'll size the house and tell you room by room, you need a six inch here, you need a five inch here, so much CFM flow here. He'll make sure it works. And he, and he comes in before you dry it, he'll come and inspect it, um, see if there's any problems. Uh, was it done the way it was designed? Cool. Uh, to make sure it works Yeah. for that particular home. So for P- if it's a higher end build and you're, I mean, for peace of mind, it sounds like a no brainer. If you're yes. trying to, maybe be a little more cost conscious, just hire a qualified, you know, yes. a, a, a reputable, a reputable HVAC. Yeah, yeah. HVAC. Okay. Yeah. And then, yeah. and then even on that point, uh, city in us has got a lot of good, uh, rebates and stuff. Uh, I think Fortis BC and hydro put out rebates where you can take advantage of those. Um, and then they actually pay for a portion of the mechanical design. And just touching on the rebates. So just mechanical design, potential rebate item are there any other rebate items that come to mind from uh so reaching certain step code levels uh, step. I, I don't want to start elaborating okay. on that but, uh, <laughs> yeah. but yeah you can start getting rebates um from them like i said fortis um terrace and gas uh your local cities sometimes have them uh new west is great uh for having rebates on uh even coming down to your energy advisor for paying a portion of that oh cool okay and I'm going to backtrack here a little bit yes. just so that we, you know, we're, you know, I can, I've t- talked about mechanical with you a few times over the years. Um, <laughs> 2008, you started building homes. Yes. What was your background prior to that? Uh, IT. IT. I, I have a 20 year telecom networking background um, for 20 years. And I was always kind of doing that and building on the side one or two a year. Uh, so I was kind of working two jobs and then, about five, six years ago, I finally quit my full-time job and just started venturing into custom home building. And the IT side, is any of that sort of background translated to home building in any way in terms of maybe low voltage wiring? Yeah, or, yeah a little or, voltage wiring, a troubleshooting networks. Yeah. People will call me all my, you know, internet's working. I'm switching for Telson yeah. Shaw. Yeah, no problems. We, <laughs> we, we fix those pretty yeah. quick. Uh, I just did one... Uh, down the street for the orchard family you know they oh. they switched to fiber optic network and they're like oh like it's not working and went there and unplugged yeah. and reset something and worked right away and so they're happy would you, um, would you say most people in your industry get confused when they start talking about fiber optic yeah networks? i know yeah. yeah so uh we uh we run fiber optic now yeah. in our houses to the outside box because it's the next uh, big thing for telus um uh, and then where i was going with this i think where your question earlier was where does my IT fall into this? Mm. I think it's more about the think process, how we plan stuff back in the day. And 
how to plan stuff in IT world, like just the thinking of it. How are we applying that to uh, building envelope of a house? Um, so I'm applying the mythology, just a thinking process. Uh, I think that's why I get kind of geeked out and started doing all these higher efficiency homes. I kind of feel like it's hand in hand, like it's just a thinking process. You, correct me if I'm wrong, but as an outsider that observed this transition, because the step code requirements is relatively new. And New West, uh, what is the minimum right now? Not that we're uh, probably, two, three. We're dabbling yeah. in step code chat, and I wanted to save it, but <laughs> just, <laughs> just to, I know I feel like you want to go there, don't you? <laughs> I do. Um, but uh, I, I got the sense that you adopted, you took initiative right away to learn it. Uh, yes. You took initiative right away to uh, get your trades and and the your sub trades on board. Yeah. And well, we all know it's coming. Yeah. Uh, and you know. The world's going greener. They want less pollution. Um, so it's a way for my company, myself, just to get ahead of the of the competition. And end of the day, just by building better homes for people, right? Yeah. So there's a value there. So you know, we try to sell ourselves. Hey, look, this is what we do. Your house it's gonna be more comfortable, more air, energy efficient, um, just a, more comfortable. End of the day, right? I think I think I have to roll into the step code conversation. It's just it's just <laughs> pulling me in. So uh, you know, just going into step code. Let's let's yep. talk about three, four, and five. Um, I, I did, you know, a, a quick Google on this, and and I, I think the simplest explanation that I could find is uh, on the website where it talks about the step code. Is step code three is twenty percent more efficient than a house that's at building code, uh, like a BC building code, a standard, a standard BC building code home. And step code four is 40% more efficient than a house at standard BC building code. Step code five says net zero ready, which um, my understanding is that's close to being a few tweaks from being potentially off the grid on electric, but without the exception of appliances, maybe? That's right. Yeah. Okay. So a bit off the grid in terms of keeping the home warm. Correct. Okay. And have pretty much minimal heating. Minimal heating. Yeah. So- uh, I mean, you'll have heating, but it'll be uh, less used, put it that way. If, I mean, it's, you don't have to put a percentage on it, but if step code four was 40% more efficient than BC building step right. code, what would step code five be roughly? Or is it hard to- I think it's about 50, 60. 50, 60. Um, that's a kind of open-ended question. I th- yeah, it's I think. tough. There's a lot of- It is tough. <laughs> it, it, it really depends on the design of your home. Okay. So, so if you look at these passive houses, let's be honest, they're a square box. Yes. So there's a lot less thermal bridging, a um, lot less studs per se, as opposed to having a jo- house that jogs in and out, right? Uh, so your energy model on your home is going to be a key factor of where you can take your house in terms of step code. Um, I've had, you know, it, the problem is with craftsman houses, they're not square boxes. No. So when your energy model looks at it, and he's like, well, how are we going to make this higher <laughs> step code? Because I always try to do a minimum four. Um, we usually achieve them because our air tightness is that good. So that helps to rate the rate home higher rating. Um, so it all depends on the design um, and, and the energy model. Because like I said, if it has lots of jogs in it, then the energy advisor is going to say, well, you got to add more insulation on now. So you got a thicker envelope, more insulation just to help out with that type of style of house. So just to kind of, be clear. I guess when you're mentioning like a step code five passive home, the highest energy efficient rating we have, yes. they're typically a box because a box is far more efficient. It has less surface area to get, get cool in one way. Um, if you did an L-shaped home or like a, a random U or T-shaped home yeah. with a wall of glass that you see over looking at cliffside, yeah. uh, that would be next to impossible to make step code five or what, uh, what would it require? It, the biggest thing is getting air tightness. Right. I think, I think a passive house is 0.6. Uh, we're going to talk, start talking numbers. Okay. Point, um, 0.6 being like the surface area of, of the 0.6 is your air change per, per hour. Like how much, how leaky is your home? How leaky is your uh, and home? 0.6 okay. is like nothing. We'll like just have it, to leave it, it at it, 0.6. It, then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so obviously, lower the number, the yeah. better. That's going to really dictate how your house achieves step code. Um, whatever step code you're trying to achieve, so tighter the better, um, but also conjunction with having a good building envelope, uh, possible triple pane windows, one and a half to 
four inches of insulation or more than that, depending on the style of the house. Yeah, on outboard. In, in, Correct. In, in addition to the wall. So just, I, I mean, to kind of keep it on the simplest level, yeah. if you're having a lot of windows and you want a high step code rating, likely doing triple pane. Yes. Um, you use a lot yeah. of solar heat gain, yeah. right? So you yeah. got to make up for that. And I, I guess uh, it likely matters which direction your windows face, whether they face north or south. It makes a difference. It likely matters. And then depending on how much heat loss you're occurring through those windows, it probably needs to be made up with extra thick walls and roof and other areas to compensate. Correct. Yeah. So um, the energy efficient home of today is, is if you're trying to achieve a step code four or higher, thicker walls, uh, less like more box, yeah. less windows. But if you yes. want uh, a unique shape with more windows, you're going to have to make up for it in other ways. Correct. Um, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. And I guess it's, it's a challenge. It's, it's a, it is challenging. Yeah. Um, uh, cause the average person doesn't want a box, <laughs> no, yeah, <laughs> right? Let's yeah, be honest. Yeah, yeah, you want your house to have some character. Yeah. Uh, but there's, there's ways of doing, you know, building a box when doing, you know, adding on lower overhangs after on top. Uh, to make it look craftsman, um, you know, I you can. I mean, if you, I, I think when you have a simple shape of a box, uh, I mean, you can make up for that simple shape with timeless design and and high end materials. You know, I I tend to yeah. find my you know keep the design simple and use better materials. Yes. You know, yeah, that, yeah, you know, just putting quality windows, black windows, yeah, you know, nice knee braces, custom made, um, yeah. you know, smooth hardy. You can dress it up mm. and hard, like, uh, I mean, it, well, I was going to, there's so many directions. To yeah, go with this. Yeah. Um, hardy is a very common material. So I assume that hardy is uh, like cementitious siding or yeah. is that most common in a lot of the buildings that you do? Or do you ever do other? Yeah. Like, I, yeah. I, we mostly stick to hardy board. Yeah. Um, I'm not a big fan of stucco. Just never liked it. I just see it always cracking and never, never a fan of it. And most houses in the U S are the craftsman look so hardy's yeah. kind of been the go-to potting like with pine or cedar soffit soften correct yeah and, yeah and I, I know hardy even has a higher end line like uh oh. i don't know if have you ever used the higher like it's the, supposed to mimic like the grain of a wood in some of the shades yes i haven't used it but yeah. i've seen it yeah. um hardy has some great products they got this color plus hardy now uh which they guarantee the paint quality for 25 years i believe yeah um the paint is baked on. Yeah. Um, they got, I think they have 16 or 25 colors in stock. If you want custom, you know, they can do it. Uh, but, you know, you, you see how they're painted. And after 10 years, you can see it's fading. That's just the UV killing the paint, right? So you get the color plus from Hardy. It'll actually last longer. But it's got to be more gentle when you're installing it, right? Not to scratch it, drag it. And, and you got to, I mean, often they would top coat it right after, would they not? Or, no, no, it's finished. It's okay. Finished. You would. They actually sell you a little touch-up kit, and you yeah. go around touch up any where you need to, um, like on the end cuts or if the scratches. Just they. So basically, you know, just to kind of help paint the picture here. Um, I know, we're kind of going off topic. Yeah, we're going <laughs> off topic. Not that Hardy goes 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 too far, but I, I huge. I used to be a. I, I ran a painting business in university, and I could even back then mm -hmm. I could tell that the cementitious siding of that era yeah. uh, was. Uh, was holding paint a lot better. So yep. one advantage of Hardy, if you're looking at Hardy versus say stucco or or naughty cedar for siding is you're probably gonna have less paint jobs throughout the course of your home. Yep. And um, and that Hardy, uh, when I'm talking about the high-end line of Hardy, I pulled up to a house in North Burnaby that had it and I thought they had clear cedar siding. Yeah. So you I almost had to, had to walk really, up and just start touching it. <laughs> I had to get really close to look at it. Um, yeah. So they there's different grades of it. Uh, it's very common in a lot of construction. It's common if you're backing onto a forest and a fire head, like yep. for, you can't have combustible siding. Yep. I'm dealing with that in a project that I'm working on right now. Um, and it just lasts. Yes. So yeah. Yeah. It's very durable. It's fiber cement board. It's good, good but product. I, that was a hearty tangent. I, I want to yeah, yeah. pull it back <laughs> into the step code for a moment. So just, uh, just, I guess just back on the step code, yep. I want to understand how did a home differ from. So the, the home that you're, diff say you're building today, that's a step code four yes. versus the home that you were building in say 2008 or, or earlier. How, how did that differ? Like, uh, on like the, yeah, that's a good question. On the easiest, simplest level. Um, easiest level, I'd say when we first started building, we we're relying on a poly a lot on the interior. Um, I'm going to say we've been relying on poly up until 2016, uh, as our air barrier. 
but in the last three, four years, we actually switched that. Now we're actually putting our air barrier on the outside of the home, uh, stopping all air from the outside. Uh, all he works, you know, the guy comes and installs it, does a great job, mm-hmm. but it's your other trade guys after. They're coming mm-hmm. in with their, you know, the driver's coming to this rotor bit, just drilling, cutting holes and slashing your pot lights. <laughs> so you're, all your poly's getting thrashed getting- and now you got holes over your house. Uh, so with having an exterior air barrier, you know, once it's up, siding goes up, no one's messing around with it. No, just talking about the thickness of a typical wall back in say 2008, it would be like a two by six construction with well, the poly. Two, two by four. Two by four. <laughs> I think it's, yeah. Oh, six. I think it was two by four. So two by yeah. four, not long. So if you bought a house built yeah. in 2005, there's a significant difference potentially between the wall assembly. 100%. Then and today. Yeah, it would be a 2 by 4 with uh, R12 bat yeah. uh, plus poly. No, so yeah. And I, I remember and, and, we used and, to... And back then, no one cared about air tightness. No. Uh, I guess the old thing was let the house breathe, right? Uh, but it, I don't know, I've seen a lot of pictures. I talked to a lot of home warranty guys. They show me pictures where these houses try to breathe and it's rotting on the windowsill and, <laughs> you know, there's moisture getting in. And, you know, it's like, I don't know if you've done a rental where you ripped up carpet off the floor. You ever see where it's black around the oh, outside yeah. edges? Yeah. You, do you have any idea why that is? No. No, I it's thought just, it was glue. <laughs> no, that's actually air moisture flowing in underneath your, uh, between the concrete and the framing. Oh, it's a big air gap, right? Uh, so I didn't know that either until someone started pointing, well, yeah, that makes sense, right? So all the cold air, moisture, dirt coming in. I, I've seen it on staircases in newer yeah. construction. Oh, yeah. Know, <laughs> like it was lined, it, uh, not to throw them on the bus, but it, there's multiple projects, but uh, Victoria Hill, the townhouses there in Glenbrook, all of them within a year had dark lines on their staircases on the edges, and mm. there was just airflow going through. There's some so, sort of, yeah. yeah, I mean, multi units get tougher, yeah. try to do air tightness. Um, and let's be honest, prior to three to five years ago, most people didn't care, really care about air tightness. But now we have mechanical systems, you know, to move the air around. Uh, there's a lot more products in the market, a lot more education on the market. Um, so things have quite changed from yeah. 2008. Well, let's go like uh, using 2005 as an example. If you look at the exterior of a 2005 built home, sometimes they can look similar to a home built today. I mean, yes, it's yeah. older. Um, the, the floor plans are very functional. They, they can look very similar. The, the difference being that what you don't see can be very different, like the wall assembly. So you give an example of two by four construction on the exterior, if it was to the base of BC building code back then, maybe it's two by six, then it's the poly, then it's strips and siding. Is that what it is back then? Uh, well, uh, I don't know when rain screen kicked in. It was 2001 uh, or 2000. Yeah, yeah, so all the leaky condos back yeah. then. Uh, so yeah, so by, I think residential had rain screen. I can't remember the exact when, but it's all because of the leaky condos mm-hmm. and the BC building changed their code to have rain screen. Um, but mostly it was just, that black paper on the outside, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, it just slapped up, not taped. Um, it just kind of rolled on and stapled on. And that's your, you know, your building paper from for water protection on the outside. If so, you, so now we're using like products like Tyvek. Yes. Um, we particularly use Tyvek commercial. Um, just, most people don't know, but the regular Tyvek is only good for 60 days in the sun. After mm. that, it's, it loses its... Uh, quality so we've been using tyvek commercial uh it lasts 10 months in the sun a little thicker um better product than their basic right so there's a lot of product new products on the market always coming on um so we try to and we use that as our air burr in the outside of the home as opposed to the inside pole mm. yeah yeah and it's, and it's a lot easier to maintain so when you're saying air barrier on the 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 air barrier on the inside it used to just be clear plastic, right? Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. And then outside, six, six, six yeah. mil poly. Yeah. 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 Um, like I said, you know, they tape up the plugs nicely. They tape up the lights, right? But what does a driveler do? He ain't going to measure with a tape and cut, pre-cut the hole in the ground yeah. and then slap it up. You know, he's going to slap up your drywall. He'll take his rotor bit and just thrash <laughs> so, it, right? So, so now he's like every, every light, every uh, pot light or lighting fixture. Now you got a four inch hole everywhere on your ceilings, right? So there's certain trades that can jeopardize your step code. hundred <laughs> yeah. percent. That, that, that's why yeah. we got away from poly because we just mm-hmm. seen too many trade people just killing it. You know, the plug 
you know, even the owner wants a plug moved after the fact, cutting the exterior walls, right? And cutting the poly, trying to fish a wire. You just, now you got cool air coming in, right? Yeah. And the home breathing from, say, a 2005 home that had, when you're talking about step code five, yeah. having that 0. 0.6 airflow yeah. sort of rating versus like a 2005 home that would yeah. have air seeping out in every direction. Is that Yeah. So I, I've heard, uh, I've never tested an old house, but talking to my energy guys who do the air blower tests, you know, he's seen houses like 10, 15, like that's all leaky. There, okay. Right? So that's arguably 20 times worse. Probably even more than or that. More, but more, yeah, maybe yeah, just exponentially. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're basically just heating the, your heat just being sent outside. Right. It's uh, that's why a lot of these old houses don't rot. If you think about it, because the heat just basically sending the heat out, drying your lumber. Um, that's when you'll see a lot of rot in these older houses. So there's a burden of potentially sealing up your home if yes. certain things aren't managed well. And I, yep. you know, one thing that comes to mind is these old homes that breathe, you're likely breathing, you know, good air, clean air through Correct. the breathability air. of the home. Yes. And the, the wood, the structure framing may not rot in a lot of cases because the moisture is not trapped. Yes. Now that we have step code four and five, where you have these, uh, well, commercial grade Tyvek on the yep. outside, plus likely outboard insulation of some sort. Yeah, our, our minimum is 1.5. So but we try to put an inch and a half of rock wool on the outside of every home. And, 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 and the quick analogy about that, uh, so like if you're not putting exterior insulation, I tell people it's kind of like just stuffing insulation in your ribs. Okay? Yeah. I know this is a quick little thinking. So when I add on inch and a half to a house, I tell people, would you rather put a jacket on your body or just have stuffed insulation in your ribs? Right. That's a quick way of uh, yeah. trying to sell somebody on... Exterior insulation. So it's a, exterior insulation is a jacket on your body. It's pretty much. It's so a, I mean, if you're walking around at minus five this morning, you know, you're, you're going to be cold. So you put that jacket over your house or your body, so you're going to feel that much warmer, right? And the, and the better the jacket, yeah. more insulation, more air tightness, thicker the, you know. Talk, touching on that for a moment, if you had, say, two or three inch outboard insulation and yep. they have, do you still have the little wood strips between the outboard and the siding? Yes. Yeah. And, that's a lot of wall before you hit. A lot of wall, a uh, lot of added costs. I think yeah. you're probably going to take me there soon. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're 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 using a lot more uh, engineered screws, eight inch screws, six inch screws. Ass. You're using a uh, thicker rain screen. You're not using the typical half inch screen. Uh, believe it or not, there's actually rain screen actually has a code of spatial separation, how much air gap it needs. Mm. A lot of people don't know that. Mm. Um, so we've been you know, how's that have more than an inch and a half? Uh, we've been using three quarter uh, pressure treated sheets. We've been buying four by eight sheets and ripping it to oh, okay. code size yeah. to make sure. So for the strips. Yeah. 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 So most houses, just an inch and a half, you can get away with, uh, sorry, inch and a half insulation, you get away with a uh, half inch rain screen. It works mm -hmm. fine. You can use your typical nails. But when you start going thicker insulation, you got to figure out how you can hang this cladding. That's exactly what I was going to get at, yeah. you know, and, and I guess when I'm talking strips, just to be clear, if you ever watch a house getting built, you'll see these little vertical wood strips being attached to the Tyvek. The, pressure the, the, treated. The, the pressure treated. They basically create separation from the siding to the, the house. And yes. the, the purpose there is you have a little air gap that if moisture gets behind your siding, which it's inevitable to happen yep. in some areas, it has a way to dry out. It's not trapped. Yes. Um, now, that why we're talking about it is because, you know, historically you have your siding just nailed right onto your plywood wall. Right. And now you have your plywood wall, your, your upward, call it even in some cases, three inches of outboard insulation, yeah. followed by Tyvek, followed by these wood strips, followed by the siding. <laughs> yeah. So that nail that attaches the siding into the house or yeah. screw yeah. probably takes a lot longer to do than it used to. It does. The yeah. inch and a half is still pretty standard. It's not bad. You can use all oh, your standard, okay. you can you still use your standard rain screen strips, standard nailing, nail guns. But anything after that, you're screwing in rain screen strips uh, to hold up the cladding and insulation. Yeah, and and I, the cost to do that is, and and I guess yeah. it, even in that process, are they not penetrating your air barrier over and over and over? Right, they are. Yeah. But once a rain screen's in, you screw it in. Okay. You know, if you pull it out and move it, yeah, now you okay. just punctured it. But but you know, if you're hiring a quality siding guy. He's going to mark out where all the studs are on your house are, and that's where the rain screen cladding should hang off. So this, so not you just don't screw into your half inch ply and then hang the your uh, cladding on the rain screen. 
um, you really want to hit the studs. So the rain screen's got to hit the studs, and then the siding hangs off the rain screen. That, that is okay. So that, that kind of rolls into one other. Like my <laughs> mind is stirring here because I got so many directions <laughs> I want to go. How would you say the typical city inspector catches the quality of the rain screen uh, in that inspection time? Like, because there's so yeah. much there. Like, you're there's not, a lot to see. There's a lot to see. Do you think um, it's thorough enough, or do you really rely on a good trade over the city inspector? A bit of both. A bit of both. A bit of both. Um, you know, at, at that stage of your house, uh, there is a rain screen inspection, mm-hmm. which they require you to do a mock up of a window. Um, so our first house that we actually did four inch of insulation on, we actually did a mock up inside the house of a window. Mm-hmm. Took a sheet of plywood, took some studs, planted it on there. Um, I consulted with a building envelope consultant who came on site, worked with my siding guys for four hours, built a mock up inside and showed them how to do it proper. Uh, so that particular house, we had the inspector come out there and we did one window and I just showed him the one window inside and he, and he was quite blown away with the attention to detail, that four inch of insulation, how we flashed it, trimmed it, you know, watch out for water issues. And so it was, it was cool. It was a good learning experience, even for the building inspector. Um, you know, they're not seeing a lot of homes like this yet, mm. but obviously it's coming more and more. So they're obviously still learning themselves. Yeah. We won't go into specific addresses, but you did a house on, I think it was, was it fourth and Queens park? Uh, yes. that was that where, and then you had a, um, uh, an energy, uh, specialist come in. <laughs> yeah. It was basically, it was, was it step code for that home? Uh, we actually planned it for step code three. Um, that house was actually my first attempt of actually trying for an exterior air barrier mm. uh, and using conventional products. Uh, so that first house that I tried, I actually reached out to a building envelope consultant and hired him privately uh, out of my own pocket uh, just to educate myself uh, how to build how to build an exterior air barrier. Um, so long story short, uh, I reached out to the city in the US. I was like, hey, you might want to come see this house. This some pretty cool mm. stuff, which I haven't seen in 15 years. Uh, so we, I, I there's a gentleman, uh, Ryan Coleman, who runs the energy stuff at the city in the US. I said, hey, why don't you come out to his house? And he came out and he's like, hey, you want to do a big demo here? And I think, I think you're, I, yeah, I, think, I, I, I think you came out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There. so we had, I think we had a good 50 people. You had, I, I uh, mean, local yeah. architects, designers, uh, I think a few building uh, inspectors came out, uh, just a lot of local builders. So we actually, did a big air test on a house, mm. um, and first time I think we I think we had like one point five, which is pretty impressive for a first time trying to figure out how to do this kind of stuff. Uh, but just showing people how to what we did, how to air seal things, um, you know, we learned lots. We're still learning. Uh, even from that house, we're doing things different from that already. Uh, we changed up a few materials. Um, we're building boxes for our pot lights that's supposed to relying on the poly boot bags. Mm, okay. Um, and that's to keep the vapor barriers up? Um, or like- all these really hard to tape up and seal. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you ever put up a pot light. It's got like four legs to it. Mm. Bang those in. You got a wire going into it. Also another wire going out. Right. And you got to put this bag over it and tape all those holes and penetrations, right? Right. So if you build a box... Um, clock all the four joints inside and the verticals in there, uh, drill one nice hole into it, uh, seal that penetration, put the polyte inside, your air sealed. So, and, and we're just taking scrap lumber and building these boxes, uh, you know, try to push clients not to push too many polyites in a house. Yeah. <laughs> so it saves us time not building so many boxes, but the boxes are robust. Uh, drywall comes in there, you can rotor whatever he wants. He's not damaging the poly at all. Um, takes a little bit of effort. Cost a little bit more money, uh, just time. Usually the lumber is kicking around, scrap material, right? We build it out of that. Uh, but going back to the house we did on 4th Street, yeah, we did we did a big air test there, uh, showed a lot of poly details. Um, but that house we did it, that house. So you can have multiple air barriers, okay? This is where people get confused. You can have an exterior barrier, you can have an interior air barrier, but you only want one vapor barrier. Right, okay. Right? So, 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 but now, so we're, Depending on the house, we're just basically focusing on the outside, make our air barrier on the outside, and then we'll loosely slap up poly on the inside just as a, a vapor barrier. And a vapor barrier doesn't need to be continuous, doesn't need to be taped, it's just up. 
Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I thought that that, I mean, I, I joined that session that you, you ran there. You're, I mean, the house is beautiful, but it was early days step code, if I remember it right. It was. And, yeah. um, it, it, you know, the, the, I believe at one point, uh, the energy guy had a smoke little, what, what was it? Yeah, it so that was, so once we did the pressurized test of the house with a blower fan, uh, yeah. we kicked out one more notch. We went, we ran a smoke machine inside of the house. Everybody went outside. Fill the house up with smoke. Like you, you couldn't even see like yeah. three, four feet ahead of you. <laughs> so I had to go shut it off after, which was fun. But uh, <laughs> smoked it. And then we all went outside. And you can see where your envelope is leaking. Yeah. And th- before you start doing the cladding, this is your great chance to go seal it, tape it, fix things. Uh, that you can actually see smoke coming out. You know, there's a slash in the Tyvek. Oh, it's a little piece of duct tape. Let's fix that. Seal it. Seals, right? Um, so you can improve your score by doing these uh, blower door tests, smoke tests, and seal stuff before you start cladding and drywalling your home. Yeah, I mean, well, I... And it's, I a one over, yeah. a one, it's, a, it's a huge opportunity you have, right? Um, Absolutely. And, I, uh, it's, and to me, it's a quite an important stage where back in the day, nobody cared, right? Let's, oh, okay, pass framing, let's slap on insulation and drywall, let's move on, right? But this is a, you know, a good step. It's, a, it's, a, it's like hitting the peak of building, right? Mm. That's what you want to do well at and then start going down and wrapping up the home right my assumption is 10 years from now it's going to be the norm and it's going to be expected that all these new energy uh requirements will be installed well or or handled well at every level with every trade every trade will be conscious of it everyone that installing it will be more conscious of it right now we're in this transition period where it's it's five years into it or three years into it and and what i'm what i'm kind of hearing is it's it's a very myth, like it's the attention to detail. You have to be, there's a yes. lot of attention to yeah. detail there. Uh, there's a lot of costs going into that wall. And if it's done poorly, yeah. you're spending a lot of money on something that may fail in a, it may fail or may fail in a terrible way. Yes. Uh, like if it yeah. traps moisture in some way. Like moisture, you get rot in five, 10 yeah. years, you're, you know, ripping out framing and, you know. These homes are designed to trap, like not breathe. Yes. And if they, if something's installed poorly, yeah. it's, it, it, yeah, it's trapped. Hundred percent. So just t- and, it, and then even going back to Fourth Street, uh, I think we we went for step code three, and we ended up getting to step code four because we did so well with the mm. air tightness, and uh, I think they got a nice fat check from Ford BC for like six thousand. So nice. that, that came out of nowhere. So the homeowners are pretty happy with that. That, that kind of covered our extra cost to do that. Mm. So it's kind of a wash at the end of the day for them. But let, let's be honest, they got a better home, right? A oh, more yeah. efficient home. Yeah, I. I I think we like we look at '90s built homes and and I see well stucco for one on the exterior <laughs> that that's probably not the best material yeah. poly B piping yes and and when I'm looking at how we might reflect back on newer homes say 10 20 years from now we might look at uh, step code four homes much differently than yeah. the 2005 equivalent even if they look the same yes yeah. So it, it, you can't change. It's hard to change the walls once they're up. It's very expensive. It's yeah, yeah. very expensive. Uh, where am I? Okay, I don't want to go too nerdy on the step code stuff, <laughs> but uh, just to kind of translate um, some. Well, or where, where do I want to go with this? I want to. I want to talk about polyair barrier. Just on on the step code four. The whole yeah. One, one thing that really comes to mind is electric versus natural gas. Yeah. So we're in this world right now where it makes a lot of sense to have natural gas in, 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 in say, a heating, like for your hot water tank, yeah. for your furnace, for your fireplace, for your kitchen range. Yes. That's very common and it's seen as the norm. Um, looking, say, 20 years out, if gas prices might, what would you, like double or more or triple? Or, who, who, <laughs> who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> we're, we're throwing out a random scenario. Yeah. But let, Look at what gas prices, we're, we're going to timestamp this. What is it? March 10th? <laughs> March 10th, yeah. Gas prices are through the roof, March 10th. Uh, <laughs> there could be a world where natural gas prices go completely through the roof yeah. and electricity looks much better. Yeah. What's, ha- what's happening in the world today, right? Yeah. Uh, war going on. And- do, you, do you think we're going to see fully electric homes in, like, are you seeing them now? I'm actually doing one right now. You're doing a fully electric home now. <laughs> we're doing a full electric home. Uh, Step code five, uh, fully electric, uh, not even a gas meter to the house. Um, yeah, a lot of people say, oh, it's going to be expensive. It's going to be expensive. To, you're going to have a high uh, electrical bill. But I always tell people, well, if your heat 
is not going to run as much because the house is so well uh, air sealed. It's got triple pane windows. It's got four inches of insulation. Uh, on this particular house, we actually put six insulation, six inch insulation on top of the roof as well. Um, so it's fully sealed from the body right to the roof line. Like so, on top of the roof, you mean on top of the plywood? On top on of the top roof? of the plywood. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is our first house, um, and it, you know, like I said earlier, house we did that four street house, and this I think it was like four houses later. Now we're doing this one. Um, so I reached out to the my building envelope consultant, and say, hey, this is what I want to do. And uh, he actually, this building envelope consultant, actually teaches at BCIT as well. So I kind of hire him on the side, bring him on site. Uh, he's got great mock up at uh, uh, BCIT. Uh, if any of you guys get a chance, uh, sign up for the Passive House course at BCIT. Mm. Passive uh, House course, BCIT. Yeah. Let's... It's a great course. It's a one week course. Um, I did it a few years ago. I probably want to do it again because things always change. Uh, but the construction program at BCIT is really cool. They got every scenario, you know, cantilevers or, you know, different scenarios where your decks, uh, you know, they got living space above it or below it, how to deal with it, how to air seal those. Uh, there's a gentleman named there, uh, James Bourget. Uh, very knowledgeable. Uh, he's a building almo consultant. He also teaches there. Uh, smart. No. If you were to, like, this is going to be hard. I'm, yeah. well, first of all, I, I, I need to backdrop one thing. I had one more question for you on these air, air tightness. Yes. So you have an airtight home. Yes. Uh, it's done well, so you're not worrying about your your foundation, like, rotting or yeah. mold. Yeah. Um, you're breathing, you're reliant completely on the systems to circulate the air in the home. That's right. It's not a breathable home anymore. Where might people that move, where might, is there a concern of breathing bad air? If, if you don't maintain something like filters or HRV no. or, or is it, is the air pretty much, is that not a concern? Yeah. For you? I mean, I, I would say if you didn't have a mechanical system in your house for fresh air, you're probably breathing in dusty air, right? Probably breathing your air is oh, leaky. Yeah. You're getting dust Did in you your see house. The dust you're in my, I see yeah. dust in my home right now. Yeah. Am I breathing that? Yeah, in? <laughs> yeah. pretty much. Yeah. So, I mean, with these newer houses, you have HRVs, right? That actually move air in your house. It actually pulls fresh air from the outside. Um, and exhaust stale air, so it's always moving air in your house. But, uh, and and through that machine, the HRV is actually has a filter in there. It's actually cleaning the air as it's going in and out. And that the HRV, the whole point of it is having the efficiency. So you're not losing, just bringing in cold air. It's actually being exchanged with the warm air that's yeah. going out through the home. Is there less dust in a home like that? Or do I would have, think so. Yeah. yeah. The, I mean, I clean my filter every three to six months, and it, it catches a lot of dust. Um, I don't find my house that dusty. You know, is it, is it like my a, wife does a good job or something? <laughs> no, it's good. Is it like a, a, water, a dryer where like the lint will build up and it could get plugged if you don't maintain um, it? Or? It's kind of, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. yeah um, it, well, the fresh air coming in, you actually get a lot of bugs on that side. Mosquitoes, because yeah. uh, it can just flow in, right? So you get a lot of pollen, yeah. which stops there. Uh, you can add actually, you know, if you got allergies and stuff, you can add HEPA filters these days before that fresh air actually hits the HRV. So you can really, really clean the air. Uh, for example, in my own personal house, my daughter's got allergies. So I actually had my HVAC guys come back uh, where my fresh air was coming into my HRV. We actually cut it there, put a HEPA filter there. Uh, so all the fresh air comes to my house, goes to the HEPA filter, then hits my HRV, and then that air is being distributed to my house. Uh, and I noticed a huge difference. She wasn't sniffly in the mornings anymore. Uh, oh, wow. So I'm pretty sure it wasn't coincidence. I think I think it really worked. And I changed those filters, and, and they're they're filtered, like they're plugged. Like, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, back, back to the natural gas electric stuff. If you yes. were to build a home for yourself today in a higher end neighborhood like Queens Park, yes, are you putting in a natural gas fireplace? So let me take one step back here. <laughs> <laughs> Are you doing that? Yeah, yeah. yeah um, please. <laughs> so Vancouver's banned gas now for space heating and uh, hot water, right? As of January 1st. I don't know if you knew that or not. Oh, no, I did not know. Yeah, okay. so on a, on a new construction, as of this past, this starting this new year, you cannot have uh, gas for your heating and hot water. And I think I read the year 2025 for any renovation jobs, retrofits, it has to go be electric in 2025. Don't quote me on that, but I, I quickly I, read about that. I was like, okay, wow, that's that's a pretty bold 
I think uh, I've move. heard something similar. And yes. I, I know Vancouver's, they're on the forefront of this. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're, I, and, and usually cities follow the city of Vancouver. Um, so that's kind of tied this back to your question. Yeah. Would you do natural gas or electric? Uh, it's tough because I think in the long term, everything's going to be electric. I think eventually they'll probably stop making gas appliances mm. like for hot water. Uh, so you know, if you're building a house now and, and you want natural gas for whatever reason, uh, you better plan to have power in those areas, just rough in some wire uh, for potential electric hot water tank, right? So think a little yeah. ahead, just run a wire. Um, well, you, you kinda, but I mean, you answered my other question there. Yeah, like, I? Well, I guess <laughs> just like in, in a scenario where you have the option today, Yes. Are you running, are, are you between fireplace, hot water tank, furnace, and kitchen range? Yeah. Uh, if, you're, if you choose to do uh, natural gas on yes. all those, are you running electrical to every single, all those as well for like an induction range? If or, it was my home and I wanted gas, I'd rough in some extra wiring just yeah. for the future. Um, but, well, I guess my other question, follow-up question is, yeah. what would you, what is your style? Like, if you were to build a home for yourself today, what would you do for yourself today? I think I'd go full electric. Full electric? Yeah. yeah. I'd uh, super insulate well, super airtight the home. Um, you know, I'd probably miss my gas barbecue. You know, it's like, you know propane. Got a fire pit. Propane. Um, you know, how often do you, you use You wouldn't those? even have natural gas for the outside? I wouldn't even no, do a gas just, meter. Just avoid it all that, together. I'd be full electric. Yeah. Um, it's the future. Mm. Uh, it's going to be cold eventually, right? It's going to be, everything's going to be electric. So you might as well get on the grid now. Yeah, that makes sense. And um, I, just to be clear, there's no, I, I haven't seen a wood-burning fireplace in any new place in a long no. time. Are there, is that a straight no for most cities or is it really just hard to do today? I haven't done one. Yeah. Um, but I think I don't think you're allowed to have one. I, no, I would have to double check that so uh, with the cities. But I'm pretty sure they ban uh, wood burning fireplaces. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so. Yeah.